I guess I should start with, hello, my name's Kate. Um, I'm very pleased to be in Hull. I've seen a lot of Twitter activity around, around hello, my name is in the site. And um, spreading it across the, tr across the trust in the UK is, is really vital so that everyone gets a message. Um, I associate coming to Hull with, with pain, really. I came to do my PACES exam to become MRCP um, at this trust and that was an uncomfortable experience but luckily I passed um, and I also had my um, CMT interview here um, and I also got the job so that, that's good. Um, so I guess I should start by telling you my story. This was me, I'm 29 years old, happily married to my husband Chris. I'm in my, just about to start my third year of training um, in medicine for older people. Lifelong ambition to become a consultant in this specialty. Um, Chris is working his way up the management ladder at ASDA um, and we're both really happily, happily married. We're starting to plan a family and I've even started taking my folic acid supplements in preparation for that. We decided in summer of that year to take a holiday went to California where Chris has an aunt and uncle um, and they live on the beautiful Santa Cruz coastline. So we took his, great, his grandma out to meet her new great grandchildren and decided we'd have a nice little trip as well. You'd think my life was idyllic from that description, but for the niggling right-sided back pain that started while I was on the flight to the US and I started getting a little bit worse and worse and worse, until I'm in absolute agony. I procrastinated over it for weeks, and then um, I just really felt very unwell. I'd gone off my food, and I just started to think that something really, really bad was going on. Chris, being the non-doctor in the relationship, decides to take charge when he finds me lying on the bed and um, rolling around in agony. And we go to an emergency room in, in the US. There it becomes apparent that I'm very sick. My kidneys have failed, my creatinine is over 600, um, and, and I'm in excruciating pain. So after some analgesia and some um, scans, it became apparent that the reason my kidneys had failed were that my abdomen and my pelvis were absolutely chock a -bop with tumours. Bang, out of the blue, at the age of 29, I've got cancer. They patched me up from the States, popped some stents into my ureters to get my kidneys working again um, and I made the decision that I wanted to come home to pursue further investigations and treatment with the NHS. There I had more scans, I had biopsies, my stents failed and I ended up with bilateral nephrostomies. I developed severe pyelonephritis. Um, and I was very sick for a number of weeks while they worked out what was going on with my health. <coughs> During that time, I'd obviously experienced a lot of healthcare and it, it was a very, very difficult time. But after about three weeks, they worked out what was going on with me. I didn't have the, at first presumed, ovarian cancer, but something much rarer and much worse. It's called a desmoplastic small round cell tumour. It's a very rare type of sarcoma that affects one in two million people. It normally picks on young, adult, young adolescent males, so why it was picking on an approaching middle-aged woman, I don't know. So there you have it. I had a very serious cancer that had progressed and spread to my liver and bones, and I was therefore in a palliative, incurable situation. I had some big decisions to make at that point. Um, I could have walked away. Um, I did a senior senior SHO job in haematology and I'd seen what chemotherapy did to people. And there was only a 40 to 50% chance that this chemotherapy was going to do anything for me. And I did think seriously about walking away at that point. But I guess spurred on by my family and my friends, I thought I'd better give it a go. The trouble with this cancer is that you can't just tickle it with a little tiny bit of gentle outpatient chemotherapy. You either give it all you've got or you don't bother. So 
I had inpatient intensive chemotherapy. The sort of chemotherapy you'd give to patients with acute leukemia. Um, I was very sick. I spent virtually five months in hospital, um, suffering the consequences, febrile neutropenia, um, bleeding, all the complications of chemo. And on New Year's Eve 2011, I made a big decision. That day, we celebrated being together as a couple for 10 years. Big day, and we did that in hospital. The nurses made it as nice as they could for us. We had a little dinner. I even had a glass of wine. Um, but that evening, after Chris went home, I watched the fireworks go off over the Leeds city skyline. And I kind of decided that the burdens of treatment were, were outweighing the benefits. Um, and all I really wanted to do was get my old life back for however short a period of time that was going to be. Um, I wanted to go back to work. My oncologist had told me that I wouldn't work again in the August and I was kind of determined to prove him wrong. So three weeks later, I was back at work and um, doing what I love to do, which is look after older people. I was then um, pretty well for 18 months, all things considered a few problems with infection, a few problems with pain, but my cancer was dormant and, and I was able to get on with my life, to progress my training, to tick a lot of things off my bucket list and do a lot of things that I'm going to tell you about this afternoon. But then in September last year I started to feel quite poorly again. I had some signs suggestive of partial small bowel obstruction and then my pain started to get worse had a scan which showed massive cancer progression and I had big decisions to make about whether I went through chemotherapy again knowing how tough it had been the first time round. I did eventually make the decision that I was going to have chemotherapy again. I had four more cycles, this time as an ambulatory care patient which made my quality of life a lot better. Um, but I still had the problems with neutropenic sepsis and still spent a lot of time in hospital. So. I got through all that and in February finished, finished that and went back to work again. And I've been back at work ever since. Scanning September showed that my cancer's possibly on the move again, but I'm still managing to work and, and progress with things. And on Tuesday, I'm going to start my first job as an acting consultant, which I think is a fairly good achievement considering everything that's going on in my life. So what I thought I'd talk to you today about is mainly about culture and, and values. Um, and these are things that have become very important to me since I became a patient. And they've become important to me since I've gone back to work and how I look after my patients now that I've got illness to deal with as well. Um, and it's been a big thing that NHS organisations now need to have values and create positive, positive cultures and I guess I'm, I want to talk about the values that are really important to me and when I'm in both patient and, and doctor role. And the first thing that really matters to me is communication. When communication is done well then you can have a much better experience of care. When it's done badly that's when it can cause psychological harm it can cause me to get very frustrated and very upset and angry about the whole situation that I'm in. So communication isn't just a buzzword that we band around, um, it really does matter. So I'd just like you to try and put yourselves in my position. I'm 29 years old, I've just been diagnosed with cancer, I'm really frightened, I'm really vulnerable. I've been admitted to hospital for further investigations and, and to try and work out what's going on. I'm in pain, I'm in a side room and I'm by myself. And a junior doctor came to talk to me about the results of my MRI scan that I'd had the previous day. At this point, my baseline knowledge is that I've got cancer, I think it's confined to my tummy. And I'm expecting probably to have an operation and then maybe some chemotherapy and hopefully a cure. This junior doctor came into my room 
sat down in the chair beside my bed. He looked out of the window almost. He did introduce himself. But after that, blurted out, I'm afraid your cancer's spread. He then couldn't leave the room quick enough. I never saw him again. He never told the nurses what he told me. And I was left in this state of psychological distress with nobody to lean on. That was a horrible situation. I don't blame that junior doctor for his actions that day. He probably was under a lot of pressure. He probably didn't have the support of his senior clinicians. Um, but every single episode of communication matters. No matter whether you're telling somebody that they're going to die of cancer or whether you're going to tell somebody that they've got to stay in hospital another night, it all matters. Anything can be a bad news to a patient. And how we handle that is really, really vital. My second key value is that the little things really do matter. And when I say little things, I mean those small behaviours that make a difference between having a good experience and a bad experience as a patient. They can be as simple as sitting down beside a bed so you're not looming over a patient. It can be as simple as reaching out and holding somebody's hand when they're visibly distressed. It can be as simple as just being quiet for that extra moment to let somebody express their fears and anxieties. It can be as simple as introducing yourself. The little things really do matter. They make that difference between you being in a vulnerable, frightened situation to being feeling safe and cared for. So for example, a few months ago, I was in hospital with, with febrile neutropenia. I was really sick. I got to second line antibiotics. My temperature was still 39. My new score was through the roof. And I, I really was not getting any better. And that evening, the consultant oncologist had to come in, it was a Saturday, and he'd been called in to see me because I wasn't getting any better. And he did lots of things for me that evening. He changed my treatment round, spoke to the microbiologist, spoke to my surgeon, did all sorts of things for me. But the one little thing that I remember about that evening was that he knelt down beside my bed, put his hand on my arm, and told me that I was going to be okay. And that and they were going to look after me. In that one moment that took se 10 seconds, I felt safe and cared for. I felt that he'd recognised my fear and my vulnerability and uh, acted on that appropriately. So those little things, they really do matter. My third key value is that the person who's on the receiving end of health really should be at the centre. Um, some people call it patient-centredness, I call it person-centredness. Because as a patient, you're first and foremost a person. You have a lot of other things going on in your life that aren't just about the disease. And sometimes it feels like you're lost in this system. That people are all working really hard to get you better or to respond to whatever your healthcare need is. But you get lost and people forget you. So I'll tell you a story. I came into hospital, you'll recognise the theme here, um, with febrile neutropenia. I, I went through the usual um, gambit of being given, having all my cultures taken, being given tazacin and IV fluids. And I was reviewed by a consultant and moved off to another ward. And at lunchtime, the nurse came to give me my antibiotics, and I said to her, is it Tazacin o'clock? She said, no, I've got you some Meropenem. And the first thing that went through my mind was, oh, wrong drug chart. They sent me to the world with the wrong drug chart. It's fine, it'll all get sorted out. The second thought that was perhaps more scary that went through my mind was, oh my God, they've got the Domestos out. What's the matter with me? And unfortunately, it was the latter that was the case. When we looked back through my medical notes, what had actually happened was the consultant had seen me, documented a lovely post-state ward round. He then diligently looked at the microbiology results on the results server. He'd found that a couple of weeks before I'd grown a, a gram-negative 
and multi-resistant organism in my urine. When he recognised that, he'd asked the junior doctor to phone a microbiologist and ask them for advice about antibiotic choice. The junior doctor had done that and she documented it beautifully, the conversation that she'd had with the microbiologist. She prescribed the antibiotics that he'd asked her to and I'd received the right care. It was a safe episode of care, but I wouldn't call it a great episode of care because it forgot one thing and that one thing was me. If you could write in big letters across the top of my medical notes, Kate wants to know everything, then perhaps we should. Um, these changes in, in treatment, a serious change in treatment, really mattered. It made a big difference to what was going on in my health. I, I had lots of things to consider if I had a multi-resistant organism in my urine. Did I need a stent change? Did I need um, more prolonged antibiotics, for example? So those does sort of considering that the person is at the centre of care and, and involving them in that care is absolutely vital. In my first job as a doctor, I worked at Dewsbury Hospital in West Yorkshire. And I worked there for a very wise old clinician who was approaching the end of his career. And he used to tell me, okay, being a good, good physician is about painting a picture. It's not about ticking boxes, following protocols, it's about painting a picture. You'll have a little extra bit of the masterpiece each, each day and then eventually you'll, you'll get this, this lovely painting of what's going on. And I guess that's what William Mosler was saying when he said the good physician treats the disease but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And that leads me nicely on to my final key value, which is about seeing me, not just my disease, I've been referred to within earshot by two consultant oncologists as that girl with DSRCT. Within one sentence, being reduced to a disease state. At a time in my life when I'm feeling vulnerable, having confidence issues, having problems with body image. That's really not how I want to feel when I'm being a patient. I want to feel looked after. I want to feel like people are looking after me not just my cancer. I sent this tweet when I was um, in hospital in August last year. Anyone who follows me on Twitter will know that I usually use my entire 140 character limit. Um, so when I send short tweets, it normally means I'm pretty upset. Um, I was in a urology ward and it was becoming really difficult to live with the fact that everyone referred to me as bed seven. It was even bed seven, would you like a cup of tea? I think the thing that I didn't realise about being a patient before I became one is that actually it's a dehumanising experience, irrespective of the quality of care you're receiving. You go into a hospital, you have all these things taken away from you. You're not allowed to do your own medication anymore. You're told what time you can eat um, and what you can eat. You're told what time you sleep. You're told when you can when you can do virtually everything. But then to lose your name as part of that experience makes it even worse. <coughs> and that kind of spurred me on to make a change about healthcare and try and make it better. This is a hospital selfie. Um, I took it when I was being sleep deprived for three days um, while I was just recovering from, from chemo. And I, I guess it, I put it up to kind of think about how we run our hospital wards. Do we run them for the convenience of our staff or do we run them for the benefit of our patients? This had been after three days of being woken up at two o'clock and six o'clock and eight o'clock and not being allowed to get any sleep. But what do you need to do when you're unwell? You need to rest. These are my stents. They are very important to me, my extra anatomic stents. They prepare my kidneys and bypass my tumours and mean that I can live a free and independent life without 
nephrostomies. mess. Um, they need to rep be replaced every 6 to 12 months. And in August last year, I needed to have that operation done. I went into hospital as a day case um, and I was absolutely fine. And I left the building just as my final set of observations were done. I was dressed and ready to go. Unfortunately, 36 hours later, I developed a fever and rhinos and felt really quite poorly and ended up back in hospital with post-operative sepsis. And this is where my journey with Hello My Name is starts. So we went to the emergency department where we were seen by a, a junior doctor working for the urology team. He was one of the doctors. He didn't have a name, he didn't have a role until I asked him. Um, and he seemed a little bit put out that I wanted to know that information about him. A healthcare assistant or clinical support worker, I'm not sure which, then came to cannulate me and take my blood cultures. She didn't have a name. A nurse then came to put my antibiotics up. She didn't have a name. She didn't check my name or my allergy status. And the whole time she was talking to another nurse about another patient while she did it. Then I met Brian. And Brian restored my faith. He was a porter. He introduced himself. He noticed that I was in pain as I got onto his trolley. He fetched me an extra pillow and an extra blanket to make sure that I was comfortable. He then took extra care pushing me over the bumps in the corridors of St James's, um, recognising that that might exacerbate my pain if he went full pelt. But the whole time he was talking to me and my husband in such a reassuring, lovely, friendly manner. Brian was doing those little things that really do matter. I was then in hospital for nearly two weeks with my sepsis. And it made a, it made a massive difference when somebody did introduce themselves to me. But the vast majority of the time, people didn't. There was one nurse that I remember did introduce herself and that made such a big difference to my day. She came in in the morning and said, hello, my name's Georgie, I'm going to be looking after you today. Just suppose if you need anything, I'll just be right outside. It took her 10 seconds, but it made such a difference that she had recognised that, you know, everyone needed to know who she was and how to get a hold of her. Um, and to, um, so provide that start of compassionate care. So one evening I was talking to my husband about what was going on um, and the lack of introductions. And to be fair, I might have been moaning just a little bit. Um, and he told me to stop whinging and do something. And that's where Hello My Name Is came from. why Hello My Name is in the signs you see around the room, why it's so important and why it makes a big difference to care. Because I believe it's not about common courtesy. I believe it's far more than that. I think it's about building a human connection with another, another human being. It's about building that therapeutic relationship, about allowing somebody to trust you and build a rapport with them. And it's also about power. And there's such a power imbalance when you're a patient. You know next to nothing about what's going on a lot of the time. And yet your healthcare professionals know so much information about you. They know intimate details about your life, about where you live, about who you live with, about what you do, about what your health conditions are. But we can try and rebalance that imbalance by simply introducing ourselves and allowing ourselves to connect with the people we look after. So we started Hello My Name Is. It's a primarily social media led campaign that's about inspiring staff who work with patients on a day to day basis to introduce themselves when they start those interactions. It's an aspirational campaign. It's not about saying you must do this. It's about saying we want you to do this. It's about our innate behaviour um, and about how we want to behave to our patients. So I've got a friend.
friend of mine who's a graphic designer to design us a logo to give the campaign a visual identity and I started blogging about it and inviting people to pledge their support to the campaign on my blog. My brother, who's an IT whiz, drew up us a website where we could collect together all the resources and um, gallery of photos that soon started to come in. And I started to write for healthcare journals. This is a piece in the BMJ. Um, and I've also been interviewed for various things like the Nursing Times. And all of a sudden, I had a social movement on my hands. Hashtag Hello My Name is started to appear across NHS organisations, in outpatients, MAUs, um, A&E departments. Started to be, come up and um, be on name badges, um, in conferences. People started to hold their own little campaigns. The students got involved. There was soon lots of um, Hello My Name is merchandise and lanyards and cups and pens and screensavers, you know, it. people have been really creative and inventive with this. I took the idea to the International Forum for Quality and Safety in Healthcare in Paris, um, where it was a big part of that meeting. Um, I had a poster, I spoke about it, and I even indoctrinated my um, own, one of my own healthcare heroes, Dr Don Berwick. We've done a lot with the campaign in Leeds. Um, we've collected over a thousand photos of people holding signs to get together with their teams or by themselves. This is the team that I work, worked with on J27. Um, this is our Chief Medical Officer, Rivette, um, sporting her picture. We had some screensavers and we asked people to pledge their support to the campaign by emailing. Um, and by doing that, they um, got a a nice hello my name is badge um, by pledging, pledging their support and within a few weeks we've got a third of the Leeds workforce which is 15,000 people to pledge their support to this campaign. So it's not something we said you had to do, we said this is something we'd like you to do. I've been asked to speak at all sorts of events and lots of very high up NHS events. I, I closed the NHS Confederation in June and in March, we presented the first Kate Granger Compassionate Care Awards, which have been put about because of my work to, to try and improve um, how we look after patients and people. Um, I'm just going to show you a video now of what the Birmingham Children's Hospital did with the campaign. My name is Alicia. Hello, my name is Paul. Hi, my name is Chloe. Hello, my name is Jeremy. Hello, my name is Anya. Hello, my name is Lydia. Hello, my name is June. Hello, my name is Nikki. Hello, my name is Rita. <laughs> that you 
can't observe every single time um, a healthcare worker um, interacts with a patient. But you can measure its impact on social media. Um, and if you look at the Twitter hashtag, hello my name is, we've registered it on Simpler, which is a healthcare hashtag analytic program. And we've had over 63 million Twitter impressions since I started it. And it works out at four tweets an hour. I'm hoping there's some tweeting going on in the room to get that up to five tweets an hour. We had a, a massive support from um, NHS Change Day, and it's going to be an even bigger, more integral part of NHS Change Day 2015. It's not just in the UK, in the NHS, that it's having an effect. I've been to Northern Ireland um, to talk there. There's lots of um, activity going on in the US and, and in Australia. You go to John Hopkins Hospital, all their interns learn about Hello My Name Is and why it's so important and watch a video that I've made. It's got representation in Canada um, and New Zealand and even in South Africa, India and Malaysia. Um, so it's, it's starting to spread global and that's the power of social media. And I spend a lot of my time doing this. Um, this is me talking at our local trust at Huddersfield. Um, but I speak probably once a week about, about my experiences and try and inspire people to think about patients in a different way and to remember the importance of introductions and what compassionate care really is. But you might ask, why is this girl who's only got months to live spending her time doing this? Why isn't she off sunning herself on a beach somewhere? And I think it's about legacy. I don't want to be remembered as that poor young doctor who tragically died of cancer before her time. I want to be remembered as the girl who changed the face of the NHS and brought about a compassionate care movement. I'm going to shut up now and let you ask some questions, but no, the talk of mine would be complete without a tiny plug for my books. Um, we raised money for the Yorkshire Cancer Centre, and together with Chris, um, we've raised nearly £140,000 um, over the past couple of years. I'd like to make that a quarter of a million before I die, so please have a read if you want to. Thank you for listening.